Hello. In this video, we are going to prove the following theorem. If f is a Riemann integrable function on a comma b, then the value of the integral is uniquely determined. Now, we're going to remind ourselves of the definition of the Riemann integral. But before we do that, let's first remind ourselves of the definition of a partition of an interval. So if we consider our closed interval a comma b, well then a partition of a comma b is a collection of non-overlapping closed intervals whose union is a comma b. So for example, this collection of closed intervals would be a partition of a comma b. And we might label these intervals i1, i2, i3, i4, and i5. And we might label the endpoints of these intervals x0, x1, x2, and so on. So in general, the subinterval ii is equal to xi minus 1 comma xi. Now a tacked partition is when we select a point from each of the subintervals. And let's say that the points that we select are these. These points that we select are what we call tags. And we might label the tags t1, t2, t3, and so on. And so this would be a tagged partition. The way we typically denote a tagged partition is by a letter with a dot on top. And in the collection, we have a collection of ordered pairs. The first coordinate of the ordered pair is the subinterval. The second coordinate is the tag in that subinterval. So this is what it will look like. Now, the norm of a partition is the length of the longest subinterval of the partition. So for example, the norm of this partition would be the length of the subinterval i2. So the way the norm of a partition is typically denoted is with vertical bars like this. So now let's talk about the definition of a Riemann sum. The idea is we have a function f from a comma b to r. And let's say that the output values of f over a comma b look something like this. And the idea is we draw a bunch of rectangles where the width of each rectangle will be the width of each of these subintervals, and the height of the rectangles will be the output value of the function f at each of the tags. So the sum of the areas of each of these three rectangles would be the Riemann sum of f corresponding to this partition. And the way we can symbolically denote it is as follows. It's the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of ti times xi minus xi minus 1. So really, this is what it would be for any tagged partition. As you can imagine, if our function dips below the x-axis, then one of our rectangles might go below the x-axis. Well, in that case, the area of that rectangle would be interpreted as negative. That's really what this sum is capturing here. So this is what a Riemann sum is. So now let's talk about the definition of the Riemann integral. Suppose f is a function from a comma b to r. We say f is Riemann integrable on a comma b if there exists a real number l, such that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that for every tag partition p of a comma b, whose norm is less than delta, we have that the absolute value of the Riemann sum of f corresponding to p minus l is less than epsilon. Now the whole point of this theorem is to prove if there is a real number l 
that satisfies this statement, then this is the only real number that'll satisfy this statement. So that's really our whole goal. Now, in proving this theorem, we're going to be using the following preliminary result. Suppose x is a real number. If this inequality is true for every epsilon greater than zero, then x is equal to zero. So if we know that this statement is true for epsilon equals 0 0.1, this inequality is true for epsilon equals 0 0.0001, right, every positive real number, well then that implies x must be equal to zero. So now let's get into proving this theorem. However, the whole goal is to prove that this real number L is the only real number that satisfies this statement. And so to prove uniqueness, suppose we have two real numbers which satisfy this statement. I'll call them L1 and L2. So suppose L1 and L2 are both values for the integral of f. The whole goal is to prove that L1 is equal to L2, because that will prove that the value of the integral is uniquely determined. Now, to prove that L1 is equal to L2, it suffices to show that the absolute value of L1 minus L2 is equal to zero. And we're going to show that this is true using our preliminary result. So replacing x with absolute value of L1 minus L2, to show that absolute value of L1 minus L2 is equal to zero, we want to show that this inequality is true for every epsilon greater than zero. So to prove this, let's give ourselves an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. Now, since L1 is a value for the integral of f, this means that in the definition, this statement is true, where L is replaced with L1. And this statement works for every positive real number. So in particular, it must work for the positive real number epsilon over two. So replacing epsilon with epsilon over two, we have that there exists a positive real number, I'll call delta one, such that for every tag partition of a comma b, whose norm is less than delta one, we have that the absolute value of the Riemann sum minus L one is less than epsilon over two. And we can do a similar thing for L2. Since L2 is a value for the integral of f, this means that the same statement is true where L is replaced with L2, right? And this statement works for every positive real number, so it must work for epsilon over two. So in this case, there exists a positive real number I'll call delta two, such that for every tag partition P of A comma B, whose norm is less than delta two, we have that the axis value of the Riemann sum minus L2 is less than epsilon over two. Now the idea is there certainly exists a tagged partition of A comma B whose norm is less than both delta one and delta two. In fact, we could show for any positive real number delta, there exists a tagged partition of a comma b whose norm is less than delta. And the reason why is because if we consider any positive real number delta, well then, by the Archimedean property, there exists a positive integer n such that n is greater than b minus a over delta. So then multiplying delta to the other side, Dividing n to the other side, that implies b minus a over n is less than delta. And so all we have to do is consider the partition of a comma b with n equal subdivisions. In that case, the length of each subinterval will be less than delta, so its norm is less than delta. So this shows for any positive real number delta, we can find a partition of a comma b whose norm is less than delta.
So if we consider a positive number that is less than both delta 1 and less than delta 2, well then this shows we can find a partition of A comma B whose norm is less than both delta 1 and delta 2. And because P satisfies both of these inequalities, well then, according to the way we introduced delta 1 and delta 2, it follows that both of these inequalities are true. And so the idea is, with these two inequalities, we can show that this inequality is true, which is what we want. So first of all, we know that the absolute value of any real number is greater than or equal to zero. So the left-hand inequality is immediately true. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add and subtract the Riemann sum inside this absolute value. So then we apply the triangle inequality, right? The absolute value of this entire thing is less than or equal to the absolute value of this guy plus the absolute value of this guy. But then we know that the absolute value of L1 minus the Riemann sum is equal to the absolute value of the Riemann sum minus L1, right? Absolute value isn't affected if we negate the value inside. But then we know that this guy is less than epsilon over 2 and this guy is less than epsilon over 2. And therefore their sum must be less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2. Epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 is equal to epsilon. So this shows that 0 is less than or equal to absolute value of L1 minus L2, which is less than epsilon, which is exactly what we wanted to show. And we have shown that this inequality is true for an arbitrary epsilon greater than 0. Since epsilon was arbitrary, this means we have shown for every epsilon greater than 0, this inequality is true. So because we've shown this statement is true, well then our preliminary result implies that absolute value of L1 minus L2 is equal to zero. But from earlier, we said that this was sufficient to say that L1 is equal to L2. The reason why is because if the absolute value of a number is equal to zero, then the number itself must be equal to zero. So this implies that L1 minus L2 is equal to zero, but then adding L2 to the other side, we get L1 is equal to L2. So this shows if L1 and L2 are both values for the integral of f, well then they must be equal. So this shows that the value of the integral is uniquely determined. And so this completes the proof. Right, and the way that we denote the value of this integral which is uniquely determined, is we will usually denote it as the integral from a to b of f, or maybe we write the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Right? Just like that. And so, yeah, that's pretty much it for this video.